Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocates and to an edition that is both peaceable and progressive. I'll be starting by directing my advocacy to the carers amongst us. When the going gets tough, the tough put one foot in front of the other is my mantra. Treasure challenges us to do more than pay lip service to the welfare of our children. Tokenism just won't cut it, she says. Emeka says, when sophistication fails, then it's time to go back to basics, such as stand behind your man. He's talking option A4. We'll be seeing a side to Libras that is rarely appreciated. He's talking peaceful coexistence, but warns that his advocacy is by no means a magic wand. Ain't that the truth, Libras? David is determined to wake us up from our stupor. He shouts out, you're not a victim. David, even the deaf ought to hear that, I reckon. When all is said and done, we all stand behind a single vision of a freer, fairer, and better society. Allow me to take the lead after the break. A letter penned with empathy can be a very direct language of communication. Dear carer, it takes a special kind of courage to care for someone so needy they can't even ask for help, but rather through behaviors that send out a coded SOS, they're screaming, I need you, several days a week, several, several weeks in the year. It's the kind of courage that is only discovered when you, carer, hit the brick wall of your own helplessness, juxtaposed with an overwhelming desire to protect and empower that special vulnerable someone. I speak of the relationship between special needs children and their parents, offspring, grandparents, close friends, and relations. Several times during this COVID-19 season, I have wondered how families with special needs children have coped. For so-called regular people, if being cooped up during lockdown and subsequently having their lives thrown out of kilter may have felt like a boiling pot experience. Then the special twist of having a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder, such as autism, ADHD, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, Asperger's syndrome, or other disability would most likely be a pressure cooker experience, no less. Dear Kara, know this, that just as your child is special, so are you specially sifted to be their guide through the roller coaster ride of life. You will discover your special ways of coping and connecting. Since, as you already know, the regular ways just doesn't cut it. You will need to ditch pride and the photoshopped way you imagined your life and repeatedly embrace the raw bombarding reality that is before you. God will hold your hand, whether you believe or no. And so will others from one season to the next. Remember, it's good to talk, so take advantage of compassionate hearers. Life was never designed to be an isolated experience. Be sure to remain sociable, even and especially when you feel like cutting off from everyone and everything. Tomorrow always comes with new opportunities and a fresh perspective. By putting one foot in front of the other, even on the worst of days, I can guarantee that you will discover again and again, as I have, that what won't break you can only make you and your life more beautiful and meaningful. Mm. Wow, what a letter. <laughs> it what is. A letter. It is a it's deeply a passionate, yeah. Oh, I, like, I like this. I almost don't have anything to say <laughs> because, I mean, it's coming from here, deep within. And, yeah, we, you know, this is um, fascinating in the sense that we, we forget that there are people living with disabilities. And, and so we do not do enough inclusion in, in the things we do and the way we do them. 
and our thoughts even. We seem to exclude them all, all, the, all the time. So this is really cool, Ekene. Mm, thank, thank you. you. Spoke to me. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I, I find that is, um, there's a connection there that I think that we, I hope that everyone who's watching um, this, this show will be able to tap into and to find that, you know, as you always say, and as we, we read, whether you're a Christian, Muslim, um, to be your brother's keeper. But in this instance, um, your brother is your child or, or indeed someone that you have a responsibility to. Um, and as you said, even in the midst of all, of all that's going on in this season, that you still find that inner strength to be, you know, to look after someone, it's, 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 it's amazing. And I think that there is a reward for that. And that reward um, is, is actually seeing that child or you know, that person who needs your care smile and be happy. I think that's, a, I, don't, I don't think, because it, 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 it's often like how you do a good deed um, without any motive and you see the person who you've done the deed for reach out and smile. I don't know whether you get that. that I always feel that this, this you know, special energy and, and love, and I think that's what we, what we need. Um, you know, but take nothing away, it's a very difficult season for everyone, financially, emotionally, um, you know, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, when we challenge ourselves and we listen to this kind of thing and we empathize with others, especially those people who have, I think it's beautiful. Yeah, Thank you. yeah uh, for me, it's um, pretty simple. Uh, it's like saying, um, when um, the road you're traveling seems all uphill uh, and there's really no one to care or that um, the depths are high and the funds are low um, no matter how bad it is you know just take a break uh, take it one day at a time and then you always get there mm -hmm. and, and 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 so it, it's beautiful it's um it applies to you know almost everybody um, and, and so know that you are not in it alone. Mm. Uh, know that um, you know, no matter how you know heavy the burden is, always know that you know if you take it one step at a time, uh, you will get there. And then another thing, like um, uh, Mecca and Treasure had said, um, fantastic. Uh, we should all, at some point, you know, reach out. The, that person you think is so rich, so worthy. You know, there might be some little things that is bothering that person that just reaching out through talk, you know, can also, you, you know, solve. Let's not just assume that, um, you know, all is well. You know, those days we live communal lives, mm. but now we live societal lives where you all, we all live in prisons, you know, called uh, gated house estates. And so you think your neighbor all is well with him because he drives big cars. But in some cases, really, you can just reach out with a simple hello, and that might go a long way too. So if we try as much as we can to also reach out and go back to, you know, irrespective of status, you know, you, the world would be a better place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just think from, <clears throat> from the perspective of um, those of us who are fortunate enough, if I'm to use that term, to, to have never had to deal with, that sort of situation. It, um, listening to you talk gave me some sense of, um, it was like a reality check that we need to have some kind of self-awareness that um, in as much as this period has been difficult for us, we like to think it's been a very disruptive period for us, that it's actually been a lot more difficult for some other people. A lot of people are actually having it really hard. You know? So we need to uh, be kind wherever we can and try as much as possible not to center so much on ourselves and realize that there are other people also who exist and who are dealing with certain situations that we don't even understand and that we don't even know about. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's impressive. Yeah, I mean, one thing I found out during this period is that actually what gets you by is not the things you thought would get you by, it's that human support, that kind word, you know, those things that you thought maybe you needed structure, you needed certain things in your life. But actually, when it boils down to it, if someone reaches out to you, and someone is there for you in their words or their actions. It's, it's all you need. Okay. Whereas I speak to the carers amongst us, Libras appeals to our peace-loving side. Can you smell the roses? We're talking flowers and fragrance after the break.
Peace, they say, is like fragrance which you can spray on others without having a portion in you. You're seeking peace, you must be ready to give peace. The very nature of Nigerians' creation and subsequent military rule, coupled with the seed side syndrome of our leaders, has consistently made conversation about peaceful coexistence almost an impossibility. But what if it's possible that we can actually sit down and agree on areas of peaceful coexistence and forge ahead thereafter? We are not unaware that such agreement and our step are needed to turn the wheels of our mutual suspicion of one another. I ask, will this skepticism, sustained by decades of conflict and failed promises, coupled with very unfavorable economic realities, ever allow us to agree to agree and agree to disagree? Like I always say, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. There's a marked crisis of confidence, not only between the people and the government, but amongst the various ethnic groups that dot the landscape of the once promising giant of Africa. This crisis is further amplified in recent times by the continuing protest on the key issues of corruption, nepotism, lack of transparency and insecurity in the land. There's also the palpable fear that the government, by their action and inaction, are either unable or unwilling to tackle most of the issues holistically adding fear to the mutual suspicion, agitations, unrest, and killings in almost all parts of the country. Today, while bandits are raining havoc and death on citizens of Kazare and other part of Kaduna State, and up not unanswered, Biafra agitators and protesters were arrested, shot at in some instances in the southeast, as government is rehabilitating some repentant Boko Haram members in the same northeast when much care is not even given to the victims of the havoc of the repentant warlord. Well, you would say same way, the kidnappers for ransom of yesteryears in the Niger Delta were compensated, granted amnesty, and asked to go and sin no more. It is true that government is always under pressure at every point with most of these problems, but the solution seems far-fetched because officials would rather focus on the latest situation rather than look towards a holistic approach that will be a long-lasting solution. Hence, despite seemingly altruistic efforts, kidnapping for ransom has continued unabated. Heather's attack on defenseless farmers is still prevalent. Even though government calls it farmers' headers conflict, I wonder if you also agree that it's a conflict. The resultant effect is the intolerance from the two major religions and the major ethnic nationals pointing accusing fingers at each other. Where is the Nigeria of the 60s, 70s, and early 90s, when it was possible for the son of Mazi from Arochuku in present day Abia State to travel all the way to Wukari Bauchi State to attend Federal Government College? What happened to the Nigeria when the son of Kokori from Kokori Village in Delta State could walk into stationary stores in Lagos and get a job without someone asking him, Who is your father? We can get it back if only we are ready to ask the right question give the right answer, and not only point in the direction, but walk the right path. I would therefore advocate today that government should understand that justice, equity, transparency, and accountability, accountable government are the cardinal pillars that sustain the peace of any nation. It's not all the time that government should suppress protests, grievance, or genuine peaceful agitations. Rather, genuine effort at dialogue and a view of the problem from the solution-driven angle. For continued suppression or disregard of grievance could metamorphose in time to violent uprising. And that's why, for me, it's like a kettle waiting to boil over. For peace to take baby step is beyond rhetorics. All of us must collectively walk the talk and be ready to make sacrifice. That we strengthen processes and ensure accountability, not only for government officials, but every Nigeria born of a woman. But we must remember, that my advocacy today isn't by any stretch of the imagination a magic wand or one solution fit all to a multifaceted problem, but rather a wake-up call to challenge the status quo, to think the impossible, connect with the leadership through consistent engagement in whatever form, take the first step no matter how wobble towards a mental adjustment needed to set us off towards a part of peace, unity, and progress. I'm just simply saying, let's begin to put our talk to action. Hmm. You know, uh, Libras, I, I agree with what you said. In fact, I'm, I'm impressed that you're so calmly 
reaching out. It's a good week. He's calm. Oh, yes, I'm <laughs> reaching out. No, he's like he's a no mediator. Fire brimstone. But you know no. what it brought to mind, even though you did say it, I'm not saying you didn't, is that song you referenced once. You know, everybody's crying out for yeah. peace and none is crying out for justice. for justice. But you did say, you obviously, the pillars. You know, but what I'm saying is, there's no way there's going to be peace in Nigeria until we get those pillars in place. Because even the reference you made to Southern Kaduna killings, and you know, even I, I know somebody who is on the ground there, and when they tell you their side of the story, it breaks your heart that you know, government officials, at least as far as they're concerned, that is by the governor there, has sent those officials, and they go and disarm the civilians. And then when the so-called Fulani headsmen come, they are like sitting ducks. And then when they are being attacked, those people are standing by, and when they call on them to defend them, they say, no, they've just been called to watch. So he was asking me as a journalist, can you not at least follow up that several of our, our children have been incarcerated, they haven't been released, but the Fulani headsmen get incarcerated, they get released. Is this not something factual a journalist can go and investigate? So for me, those things are injustices that will never die. It's like their blood is crying out for, for some kind of you know, recompense. Even Wale right. Shoinka once said that the fact that the president went and said leave peaceably is not enough. You, where there is wrong, there must be you know, some kind of writing of that the wrong. Well, yeah. Which is why I'm wondering, um, Libra said we can get it back. And I'm wondering inside of me, isn't it too late to get it back? No, no, uh, is it late. not? If it no. is not, uh, you also talked about engaging our leaders, leaders yeah. meaningfully. I hope so. Because it looks like Nigerians are just tired. It looks like but, they, but their, are, their attention is divided in many ways now. Can we get it back? Yes, we can. We have, I, we have know, to believe. You <laughs> know, let, let me say that um, you cannot decree peace. That's what you I'm cannot, saying. you know, it's not something you pronounce. pronounce. It's yeah. like love. Love, they say, is action. It's not done by a uh, mecca saying to someone, oh, I love you. No, no, no. You have to do what is required of love. Love is a responsibility. Love is a call to Isn't action. It's a response to yes. something. And so when we talk about peace, it's not something a high government official say, let them go and live peaceably or let them, you know, be at peace. Mm -hmm. No. Like they say. Yeah. yeah. You have to find peace. Like the Cameroon-Nigerian peace, peace you, yeah. accord. You have to do what is required for peace. But let me also say that, you know, it is to me that the fact that we, we have a situation where um, our government, our structure of governance was born, there's a certain status quo we've entered into. We entered into it maybe... 60, 70 years ago. And, you know, every other thing is, it's like sitting on a treadmill and we're just moving. You see some movement, but we're not really we going progress. anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Sure no. And the, the thing is that no one wants to get off that treadmill and do what is necessary. Yeah. So we are born in status quo. We love the status quo. And the, the fact of the matter is that, um, I guess people are afraid of the real change. Because the real change requires rigor, plenty of hard work, exactly. and plenty of vision to do what is required. And I'm, I'm, I'm worried that um, you know, we're not ready for what we, we claim we want. Yeah. And then again, it looks like those who are peaceable, who follow the path of peace, end up getting nothing at the end of the day. Look at you, we're talking about the victims of the, the Southern Kaduna crisis. Well, I'm looking at the people of the Cameroon, Nigeria, that border peace accord. What has happened to them uh, um, years after? Is it right to be peaceable? I know it is. It is but no. can we not follow up this David, peace, you have the answer. This <laughs> path? From, from, the, from the point you of know? view of, of someone who engages with governments on several levels in the journalistic sphere, in the political space, I think that there exists a very, uh, a very bad status quo in the way the Nigerian government relates to Nigerians. And that is that if you want anything done in Nigeria, you have to do. You have to get it done by force. Oh wow! True. If you want, if you cannot engage with the government and speak English to them, and get a response, you have to point a gun in their face. That's a generalization, surely. To, but generally, that's but how he, it but is. But he's right. Like, history, the history of how things have worked out. This bears it out. If you if you write a a series of critical stories about the government, depending on where you are in Nigeria, you might get locked up, right? But if you decide, okay, I'm not going to risk getting locked up, I'm going to pick up a gun and point it at the governor instead, okay, like what then, you, said, you know, rehabilitation. Rehabilitation. Exactly. Yeah. So, so how do some, we change that dynamic? So exactly, the, which is why I said, can we get it back? So well, the, uh, the, the, the people who are, because I don't like talking about the government as if it's this extraneous yeah. entity. The government is also yes. us. Yes, that's true. We also need to make it such that the people who we 
not just support or vote or whatever, but even the way we engage with them, it has to be from it has to be from this perspective that look, you are here to serve us. Yes. You are here to listen to us. That, 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 you are not I here to lord like, it over us. Exactly, you are not our ruler. Yeah. And that's why I said we have to remember that we must engage them yes. at time. the right answer and be ready to provide answer. Well, time. <laughs> Treasure and I are definitely on the same page today. We are both down for action. So after the break, let's see Treasure's action. You got that right, Liberus. I'm saying a token is only as good as the substance behind it. I'll be talking about the Nigerian child and the tokenism of governance. Nigeria will be 60 years old in October. It has no enduring benefits for her children. The childhoods of many of them have been taken from them by poverty and the thoughtlessness of their governments. Child benefit is a universal payment. Now let's look at three countries with a grip on their children from birth. In Ireland, the destination of many Nigerians in the past, child benefit is £140 per month for each child. The first payment is at the start of the month, following the birth of the child until the month the child turns 18. Presently, the government is working at allowing children born in Ireland to foreign parents to be eligible for citizenship if they've been resident there for three years. In Canada, the destination of Nigerians nowadays, about nine out of 10 Canadian families receive higher payments under the Canada Child Benefits, CCB, than before. The CCB has a, had a positive impact on families' incomes, playing a key role in reducing child poverty. There were 334,000 fewer children living in poverty in 2018. Let's go to Finland. Preschool and daycare are basically free. I know I said three, but this fourth one is important. Let's go to South Africa, where the child support grant was introduced in 1998. In the last 14 years, the social grants program has evolved into one of the most comprehensive social protection systems in the developing world. And now, Nigeria. The Nigerian child gets no benefit from being born in Nigeria. The child born in Nigeria's oil-rich region gets nothing, zilch, nothing from the government, nor from the elders of the land who misappropriate the wealth. Free education instituted by Nigeria's founding fathers in the past is no longer free in many states. And instead of a purposeful, meaningful, futuristic benefit for the Nigerian child, typically of Nigeria and its many dramas, Nigerian leaders engage in tokenism in celebrating the Nigerian child. They fall over themselves to be benevolent to children spotlighted on social media. A proper talent identification scheme to harness the gifts and talents of our child stars will have been more pragmatic. But what do we have? Strange ad hoc scholarships here and there, the singing hawker boy adopted by the Imo state governor, a visit by the Delta state government to the girl who defied the incessant beating of our teacher in school, and the latest is, mommy, calm down. A state government actually used that as a peg for its Salah message. I mean, in another climb, his mom will be the guest of welfare by now. The Nigerian child benefits nothing from both the federal and state governments of Nigeria at birth. The imported school feeding program has become a stillborn for the government of the day. Its implementation and success has remained a mirage. I've got myself thinking aloud about the cost implication for the Nigerian government. What does it really cost to follow through on this comprehensive feeding for our children? Why is it so difficult to create simple indigenous foods, meals that the children can write about as the memories of the Nigeria of their time. The value chain will include farms and farmers, vendors, a well-run kitchen that the children can also visit on excursion to see how the meals are cooked. There'll be food for the children and there'll be employment for the adults. It will be a win-win. But alas, what do we have? Nigerians are quick to defend the Nigerian government with the rhetoric of it being broke. We're broke, Nigeria is broke, Nigeria is broke. Yet we hear of humongous embezzled money almost every week. As Nigeria clocks 60 in October, are we as citizens going to start engaging our legislators more, more purposefully for our basic needs? 
or the majority of us will continue to be tranquilized by soft porn on cable TV to drown our disappointment. Call it by his name, Big Brother, Big Brother Nigeria. Oh my goodness. Can I say that? Um, <laughs> very passionate. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, advocacy. thank you for the passion. This is very passionate mm -hmm. advocacy. Um, I don't think that, I mean, and the evidence bears me out. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the Nigerian government, whether today's government or the previous government, um, has ever really cared about a Nigerian, the Nigerian citizen. Not the dog of the child. You know, the, the Nigerian. No. Um, I don't think that is the case. They, they make the right noises, you know, about what it is, but about what the responsibilities are. But they don't do the things that are necessary. And I can tell you this because the evidence is clear. You pointed out to some of it. There's no data to even talk about where, how Thank many you. kids are being born, where, at what age. There's no vision that should drive the collection of that data and what should be done with that data. So when you, when you talk about it from a point of, and we see it, we're talking about COVID now. Akena, you did a wonderful advocacy about um, caring for, for, for children, especially who have um, special needs. Have you heard any government official talk about this, this thing, even within the season. Have no, you heard you even want, with... You see even, one on the street selling granola yes, and then even, somebody video... Yeah, even within this, this same COVID adopt. season. Okay. Have you heard anyone talk about... We talked about it on, on this show. I remember I was, I was on this show. We talked about education, how the online learning, whether there's been any proper idea, vision, planning about what needs to be done to drive this. No. So I, mean, I, I don't think, I don't I think, think, was, I don't think we care. For our children. Yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately, that's the message that comes across, but not because I suspect none of them care. I feel the system is such that even the few that care, it, st it, st it strangulates them, you know, because you do get little ideas that some people want to make a difference. I don't want to name names, but you, you, the general impression you yeah. get is that, I'm coming, let me, let me just say it for the record. How? General impression you get, no, because I try and put myself in their shoes. Even with all the will in the world, if I got into the system as it is today, I will struggle to make an impact. I use my work environment as an example. There are certain things I know I would like to be done, did I call but I already times, accept. I already, I call the <laughs> let me finish. Times. But let me just make this statement that I already know from the get-go, because of the culture that surrounds us as people, I, I better just save my breath if I kill myself and say, let me stop here. You know, fight my, choose my fight. But let me just make the point. I was going to say... What I admire about you, Treasurer, even with your advocacy, is that I see you behind the scenes, and I know that you're able to, when you talk of legislature engagement, you've done it. So one, one of my dreams when I finally got my head around, okay, this, this society is too dysfunctional for words, is I wanted to, I registered an NGO where I thought, get the citizens engagement, prepare the groundwork, just make it easy for people to just join it, sign a petition, go and do all the collating, like you're doing with the sanitary pads thing, and then just get people. So I would love it, like this children's thing, child benefit, because I know, I know people who are recipients of the very same. It's, it's, as a, it's an investment, the Kenne, the but the Kenne, mindset isn't there. Government people, um, do you feel out of place that Yaradua, as president, his first grandchild was born in America? If um, that's not surprising, um, Seriaki Dixon as governor, the wife gave birth in America. Mm -hmm. I can name, I can, I can call many. So they get to these places, receive these benefits, you know. And they enjoy They it. attended to fantastic healthcare system and then they come here. They can't replicate them, but yet they boast about, you know, shanties that they have built that they call the World Health Center. I talked about how Akbabio built a world-class hospital that couldn't treat him when he had minor bruises in a car accident in Abuja. They flew him to London. And, and so, you talked about few people who care to do it. There was no care. You, you talk about treasure. If treasure becomes first lady, you already know what she would do because she's been doing it. Mm. And that's why the program will not die with her when she leaves office. But she'll be surrounded name, by people who may not name one, make it easy for her. No, but if it's a, a, an idea that she has bettered even before she got to that limelight, she's passionate about, she can only share that passion. You can't, we say, Nemo, that quad non habit. You can't give what, what you don't have. have. And so you find out that most of these people, of these people, they get into office, it's, please come and advise me, what can I do now? You know, as the first lady, 
work. He said, oh, take on autistic children. Oh, yes, this is a new program, the pet program of the first lady. You hear them jump around, collect money from people, use a few children to showcase the program. Once they leave office, because the passion was never there, you know, the program just died down. And that's why there's no continuation. There's no care. So the question the is, why are they place. even there in the first place? The system, it is to show off. It's it, not the so system. why are we electing first ladies that don't have it is drive? Not, it is you don't not, elect first ladies. Well, why are we even electing uh, people, people whose wives so that generally don't have any inspiration? That's why from day one, even the people, when they say likes attract, mm -hmm. you don't have inspiration. You marry somebody that would also not have inspiration. Guys, so, producer so, is telling us around. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but, but let David well, just have well, a quick word. David, you can just... My, my, yeah. my, like, the only thing I would add to the conversation is that, well, I'm not so sure that Nigeria has necessarily has the capacity to institute like a comprehensive child benefit program, it would be ideal for it even to do that. Even the feeding program. I'm not sure Nigeria has that capacity. And even if it did, the reality of the Nigerian government is that that money is just going to go missing. So from my, from my perspective, oh. what I think the Nigerian government should do and that it can do is focus its efforts into investing in education. That is the key thing. It's education that will change the story of the Nigerian child. But whereas they're not doing that. It doesn't that. matter how much Even feeding... the education... Whereas is, they're not doing that. I remember Emeka's yeah. um, advocacy the other day. It's still the same colonial thing. Infuse... Um, anyway. Beautiful hair, though, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, so, okay. Taking stock of how effective we are is good for government as well as for us. We love that you help us do just that. On Hush Youths and Hush Leadership, T-Boy Kalechi is a fan of Libras and says, I like this first man. He always points out the facts and the truth. Whereas Silv V, a man of few words, simply says, great job. On the theater of absurdity, God on Kingdom Kingsman simply says, great one. You know what they say? A word is enough for the wise. Thank you for your feedback, T-Boy Kalechi, Silv V, and God on Kingsman. On to woke for our own good, Black Sun Horizons, 44 Black Horus has done a lot of uh, reflecting and has this to say. If you have the commanding, do it my way or no way, I know what's best attitude, not only with children, but with practically anyone. It simply will not work in the West. And really, why should it? I understand both perspectives on how to relate with children, but the key difference is that in methods that are less aggressive and forceful, and we find that they actually work and often far better than imagined. Everyone has their own particular world or way of perceiving and acting. There are individuals with their own minds and even legitimate self-interest. Often, the best, most powerful way to persuade, in my opinion, is to find out what the other party's interests are and then zero in while simultaneously linking your lesson or message. Thank you, Black Sun, for that thought-out feedback. Continue to advocate with us on our social media platforms on Facebook, plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plus TV Africa.com slash the Advocate. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, plus TV Africa. I don't know about tranquilizers and soft porn. I'll be talking on sober issues of state after the break. So, it is often said, retracing one's steps can be the best strategy when you are lost. So my advocacy this week is a return to June 12th. So last week on this show, I spoke on the need for all of us to become politicians, despite the seeming challenges. This week, I continue in the same spirit, an examination of our electoral process, and advocate for the adoption of an electoral system based on some of our valuable social cultural experiences like we did with option A4 during the um, June 12, 1993 elections. I know we're not in the month of June, but my advocacy will reference the June 12, 1993 elections as an important marker for democracy in Nigeria. Not essentially about the tragic outcome of that elections, but rather on the process which led to the design of the election itself and how that process has come to be considered to be the freest and fairest election ever in the checkered history of Nigerian political process. When Professor Humphrey Mwosu, the head of the Federal Elections Agency then, decided to, to choose option A4, as he called it then, many people raised an eyebrow. 
and the process which he later explained as being based on the old African system of choosing leaders for specific tasks. Oh yeah, so my advocacy is on the need for us to perhaps re-examine once again the electoral processes in Nigeria, especially given our recent troubled past when it comes to election, and not just in Nigeria, but indeed across the continent, where the process to elect leaders have often led to bloodshed. So June 12, 1993 was a watershed moment for us in Nigeria. It proved that very often the simple things that are organic can be the solution to seemingly complex situations. Since 1999 and the return of democracy in our country, elections have become a do or die affair. The processes are often convoluted with voter registrations that begin and end haphazardly instead of continuing. Card readers, voter cards, and uh, reading machines that are not that smart or transparent, even the transparent ballot boxes that contain fudged ballots, manual counting by professors that are numerically challenged, electronic vote submissions without electronic servers, election observers and soldiers at polling booths who sometimes only ensure that the chosen ones get to vote. So we have come full cycle. But like most things in Nigeria, Nigeria at the moment, we still receive to accept and acknowledge that we have a broken system from the basic foundational structure of our nation and to how we elect our so-called leaders. We must begin the process to redesign Nigeria brick by brick, ideas versus ideas, asking the often difficult question and choosing solutions which are organic and a reflection of who we are and how we are. Which is why the idea of Professor Humphrey Wonsu's option A4 for, appeals to me, which basically says, stand by your man. In my village, for example, no man in Enugu state, whenever there's a need to elect leaders to do a certain thing or to become a chief or whatever, the system is clear. You know, the front runners are called to stand in front and villagers and people who support whoever are asked to stand by their totems and the people they, they, they want to. And that's it. The people are counted. And that's the job done. The vote is counted in the presence of everyone and the winner is known immediately. I dare say the system is not exclusive to Nigeria or to my village only. In any case, we did this successfully on June 12, 1993, and it was adjudged, as I said, the freest and fairest. But again, like most things, we kill the man and the vision of free and fair, perhaps because it will expose our banal stupidity or greed. For me, it's time to go back to our recent history and exhume the skeletons of this our past. Perhaps we can find the spirit to rebuild our own electoral system. Uh, yes, um, uh, I, I quite agree with you. Um, even though we mooted that idea um, in the last election um, with um, the electoral amendment, um, those that benefited from a seemingly transparent process kicked against it. Uh, that no, um, the um, realities of June 12th have changed and so it can no longer be the same way, uh, you know, all of those things. The same people that agitated for um, amendment to the Electoral Act that the president should not be allowed to single-handedly nominate the INEC chair, you know, benefited from all of those campaigns, got into office, and they kicked against everything they campaigned for. And, and so we are where we are. And, and really, and then the same people that will kick against it in the general election, you see them use it in their primaries. If you watch uh, those state um, APC primaries, you know, they said we were going to ensure that it was transparent and open. And, and so what did they do? It was basically, you know, the um, amended option A4. You queue behind your man. And, and then at the end of the day, they give you a ballot. You go and then you cast. But so you count the people on the queue of the candidate. And also, in most cases, it tallies with the, the, the counting, the voting. But here, they tell you the parties are many now. And so you would have, you can't have 100 lines, 100 queues, you, you know. But you forget that even if you have 100 candidates, that many of them actually score votes, you know, in the real election. And because they don't want the election to be transparent. So which brings me back to the people. I have advocated that we should stop going to churches and mosques. On Friday, instead of going to mosques, let us just use that time to do a quiet protest just at the center of town to say we've gathered here today government these are the basic questions we need answers to on sunday all of us instead of going to canaan land 
Fire on the Mountain and uh, uh, the other one, or Catholic Church, will gather also and say, after all, we're going to churches online. So, but we'll gather and say, government, these are the basic answers, uh, questions we need answer to. By the time they see such, you know, upright, building momentum, I tell you, gradually, you know, we'll be able to unite to ask those common questions. Libras. Until we do that. Thank you. We keep suggesting. Thank you, Libra. It's precisely what I think we should do, which is why I made reference to the fact that how do we gather so many Nigerians to watch you know, this soft porn on, on, on cable TV. And we cannot muster, you know, the same sort of numbers of people to say, hey, leaders, this is what we want. This is what you need to do for us. Why do we engage in frivolities and the, we, we major in minor, and then we leave the major things about governance and about our lives, our existence, our well-being to chance but then we can muster ourselves to watch a TV program. If we have that kind of numbers, then we can make governance. We can challenge our leaders to give us better governance. I agree with you, Liberals. I agree with you. The numbers of people, Nigerians going to church and to mosque, if we muster that the sort of numbers to ask our legislators, our, uh, the judiciary and all these arms of government, will go somewhere. I mean, let yeah, cool. Let me just mention, um, in in support of uh, Emeka's point, um, I remember, I th I'm not sure if it was just before the last election or just after, when the Electoral Amendment Act was being debated in the public space and in the National Assembly, a kite that was being flown was that the so-called option A4 no longer suits Nigeria's reality because, you know, as he said, there are too many parties or the population is different now or that um, we should be looking more towards this chimera called electronic voting. voting. And I just want to point out that the idea that Nigeria is this, has become this like super advanced society that can move toward electronic voting, when we haven't yet figured out how to count A4 papers inside a, <laughs> a, a ballot Because A4 box. is so transparent. It's ridiculous. You, you can't fake mm, it. We need, to, it we need to be realistic. Have electronic voting without a server. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be realistic about who and where we are. How we need to understand do? that we are, we are a poor country, first of all, we are a uh, technologically disadvantaged country. So all these kites we keep flying, oh, card reader and uh, permanent voters, smart card and all these things. And then on the election day, the card doesn't work. The reader because doesn't read it. That smart, Meanwhile, you, you can just stand well, I have to say, behind actually, point, your man. No, it's, you it, it, it's a revelation for me because I've always been an advocate of electronic voting. No Not way. least because, and, and listening to you, maybe I'm, I'm still rethinking it because I, even when I considered what you were saying, I said, okay, is it that people will not go and intimidate people from coming out in the first place to stand, let alone count? Stand and is it that somebody, man. when you stand Something and you count, you. someone can't still, where there's a will, there's always a way. Someone can still manipulate the figures. Is it that those things are foolproof? I know, I know not, what you're saying. Not but I'm it's much easier I'm hearing that it's easier. No, I get you. I, I, that's why I had wanted electronic voting. But clearly, all you people, are, I'm outnumbered in terms of people who don't believe <laughs> who can get to that promised land. That would have been my own preferable. Even America. Because, with because so the Big Brother she referenced, you know, they're voting from their homes. So yeah, and they vote, there are multiple votes and all sorts of things. They That's can not do it's, it's a different it's I'm a just thinking, well, platform. maybe, maybe oh, what okay, I'm happy, what yeah. I'm, let me just say, what I'm mm. happy about is that at least let someone even think towards finding a way that, because for me, the ballot box is the only way we're going to get that change of governance, get the right people in who are representative of our desires so that we can finally get this. And one of the ways to make it open. Yeah, exactly. When you make it open, stand, so, yeah, people would int intimidate, some people will be intimidated, but it is much more transparent. And then also, this idea of vote buying also will be there, but it will be reduced because I can no longer collect money here and collect there. So because yeah. at the end of the day, I will have to stand somewhere behind someone. that people so, will see. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. So, well, um, if you thought that uh, I took you back in time, wait till David, our resident historian, is done with his advocacy after the break. The reflection we see in the mirror can be obscured by our inner self-image. My advocacy today is called, You Are Not a Victim. A few weeks ago, I received a video from a contact showing the live map of air traffic around the world. Despite the coronavirus downturn, Europe, Asia, the Americas, and Oceania still looked relatively busy. Africa, on the other hand, was almost completely desolate. 
Now, according to the voiceover in the video, the near total absence of flight traffic on the African continent was because Africa is being excluded from the global economy. They are excluding Africa. It immediately struck me that this was yet another instance in a growing series of personal observations where I had seen an African economic or political conversation completely sidestep any attempt to engage facts and data, but instead use an emotional appeal to victimhood. The instances varied widely, from the ongoing Ivorian crisis, where some say France is sponsoring the crisis, to insecurity in Nigeria, where some say America is behind it, mm -hmm. to even the coronavirus outbreak, where you know, some unspecified they want to depopulate Africa. The common thread running through all of these ideas is that, one, Africa is a victim by default, regardless of whatever crisis is on ground, and two, the explanation for any crisis can always be found in a conspiracy theory as against publicly accessible facts and data. So is Africa really a victim, and are we all simply unfortunate victims of power plays and geopolitical tussles between everyone from world powers to the global banking elite to the Illuminati or Anunnaki or whatever other shadowy group of people allegedly controls the world? To answer, the, to answer that question, we need to examine why there is a widespread belief that Africa is being puppeted and is not actually in control of its own destiny. 60 years after most of the continent gained independence, despite controlling our own borders, education, taxation, money, industrial policy, public investment policy, and military, Africa has barely made any progress at all. The realization that African independence has not delivered the results hoped for in the 1960s is very painful. What would be even more painful, however, is admitting that the independence project and the subsequent post-colonial projects across the continent were in fact selfishly conceived, poorly designed, and terribly executed. Something that, this is the same thing as saying that Africans are not capable of self-rule. The shame of admitting our own historical and continued failure drives people to instead look for a convenient scapegoat that is suitably large and ever-present, yet distant and untouchable. And what better scapegoat is there than the foreign, you know, preferably white, boogeyman? So when we in Nigeria make decisions like refusing to unify our exchange rate or closing our borders despite a land trade surplus or wasting development funds on the succession of nonsensical white elephant projects, we can blame the resulting economic dev devastation and political instability on an external boogeyman, not on ourselves. It's never our fault. Nobody made us self-harm like this, but we can blame everyone except ourselves because accepting responsibility and admitting failure is what will break our political status quo and make us realize that many of our foundational assumptions are simply wrong. Is there actually a boogeyman? Are there people out there that don't mean well for Africa? The answer to that question is not yes or no. The correct answer is, so what? If geopolitical interests that allegedly want Africa to remain poor and underdeveloped could not stop China and India from fixing key systemic issues and building themselves into economic powerhouses, they cannot stop Africa either. We are, in fact, the ones who get to decide what we want our destiny to be. No Bretton Woods financial institution, giant alien lizard, imperialist white devil, or Bill Gates antichrist has the power to do that for us. In fact, if you draw the line back far enough, even back to slavery and colonization, you will discover that at every point, Africans themselves, through our own greed, selfishness, and short-sightedness, and lack of a global perspective, always made the decisions that led to their own downfall like raiding rival settlements and selling captives to European slave buyers who almost never ventured past the coasts. Nobody at any point in time has ever had the power to waltz into Africa and cheerfully turn its one billion people into helpless victims. We are not and have never been that powerless. And the same holds today. You are not a victim. You know, David, I, you know, whilst I agree with you on the importance of self-determination of, of deciding what you want. Um, because as you've given your own advocacy, you also talked about India and China, and we know what Singapore did yeah. and what Taiwan did. And what's this country that fought America, Vietnam, and it's now, Vietnam is now you know, like booming. So we can see that countries can make the leap. Um, but I also will want us to recognize that um, I, I don't want us to simply just dismiss, even though 
yes, as you said, again, this, there was collusion with, you know, amongst us as during the slave uh, period. But I don't want us to dismiss the fact that we, as a, you know, when you are, when you, when you are in Africa, I'll give you an example. If you go to Uganda, there's often this joke that if you finish eating banana and you throw it outside of a window, you might wake up in the morning and see the thing sprout growing. It's that the land is so fertile. And we live at a time, because I remember attending a, a conference a few years ago, many years ago in France, and someone was doing the same kind of, um, and said, you know, I want to show you two things. I want to show you a small village in, a, in the south of France, small village. Okay. Um, and the total economy of that village is this amount of money. Minus school, I want to show you a village in Cameroon with more money, more generals, more multimillionaires, and the village did not have accessible roads. So he says, what? is really the problem. How come this little village with less money and, you know, is better? You can see the pictures of the village, nice roads and everything going for them, you know, public service, post office, restaurants. And, and then this village in Cameroon with people who have more wealth, one person had more wealth than the well, entire village in, in, in this small part of France. So what, so what, what happened? Is it a climate? Is it the, mm -hmm. so I agree with that. But there's a, there's a I, I think my point really is that let's not trivialize <laughs> the role that slavery, whether we let ourselves be enslaved or not. I don't want to be, you, you know, I don't want to follow your argument a bit like the Kanye West's kind of movement and to say, you know, well, we let ourselves be captured. We, from an African perspective, we put, we, we have a consciousness. We're more peaceable. The people who rule the world today, I don't know if you saw Kelichi Okafo's thing on, on, on her channel on Instagram the other day where she talked about violence, people who are more violent succeed more. And we, the example we talked about, peace in Nigeria a few minutes but ago, reflect that. Where, where, where we I need to... to understand that you have power. It's not given. We need to take it. We have been a people because of our climate, because of the way that things grow. Mm. No, okay. I'm saying. Let me come in. Let me come in because of time. I need, to, I need to granted. snatch it from you in a bit. What I'm saying is, why I'm, I'm almost 100% behind him, and I rarely get 100% behind people because there's always one area you won't agree with, is because I think at some point we need to own our own destinies, and that's what it says to me from an individual point of view, from a collective. Even I take back the one I said about, oh, if you're in governance, you know, um, the system is too much. No, I take that one back. Okay. Wherever you find yourself, own it and make. Complete, take pres complete responsibility for your choices there to do your 100% you can. I'm tired of us continually making excuses, climate, whatever. I'm, I'm not interested anymore. We've done that. We've won the T-shirt. It's time to move forward. It's time to now say where we are now, where we don't have these people that are doing well, don't have two heads. Let's take it from here. For, if it's for... citizen engaging the leaders, let's engage. Whatever it is that is the next step from our below power position, we must own it and not look back. We have to look forward. No, I, you I, know, think, I mean, why, how can Live Mohammed think, come and be telling us they didn't sell uh, military equipment? You know, what kind of nonsense are they? I, 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 they I didn't think, sell machinery to us, even though we paid for it. I, I, I'm I not think, interested uh, in those excuses. I, I think um, um, <laughs> Emeka simply agrees with David, but just trying to sound a note of warning so that you know, people don't go with the wrong notion of, oh, you tolerate slave trade, uh, because after all, we sold ourselves out. But you also forget that at some point, they came with guns and superior fire, firepower, and and so, um, and then, bought. and then, <laughs> no, 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 and then well, imposed no, certain persons yeah, and created an economic and model created, that made slavery yeah, a business. Imposed certain persons, yeah. you know, some well, we persons are we were are. made district heads, right. and they had authority, they had the backing of. So, but I don't want to go that that route. I agree with you that um, yes, we at some point will have to accept our fault, own the process. Yeah. Because I agree we are not victim. Um, the superpower, we always want to make you a victim. It is now left for you to say, I will accept to be a victim, exactly. a slave forever. Or I will say, you know what? I won't take this. My I will want now. also grow and look at you face to face. Mm -hmm. Like um, Fessor Skiamu once told me, I remember then, you know, he was still at Maryland. He bought um, an SUV. And I said, ah, man, this one is big. We said, yes, sir, because the people are oppressing us. Are up there, so I want to step up and look them eyeball to <laughs> eyeball. eyeball. And, 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 yeah. and, and truly, Ozekoman says, Oshoma, bulldoze your way there, spread your hands, and refuse Don't to be apologize. pushed down. Yeah. And it is the same thing. Nigeria need to realize that we need to bulldoze our way up there, spread our hands, and refuse to be pushed eye. down. But if you don't, 
they will continue to look at you down and Precisely. say, look, you are not up here. But, but, you know, you are a baby. David, this is fantastic advocacy. Yeah, yeah. Really solid. Well, I think it is as well. And I, I just want to say, just as you tell an individual, then you tell a collective, you know, a group of people, you are only a victim for as long as you see yourself as a, victim. a victim. And you can shake, you can break loose from that victim mentality mm -hmm. and say, you know what? I take control from today. I take charge today. And that's the whole essence of my advocacy today and the general advocacy we've had today that mm -hmm. Nigerians can take control and take charge yeah. of their lives and their, and their well-being of their existence. I'm the future existence. for this you know? I'm, getting, and, be, I'm and getting behind my woman. I'm going to get behind my man. I'm getting behind my woman. <laughs> so please take charge. <laughs> please, Treasure, what's your next move? Let's collaborate. It always feels like a journey on the advocate. However, here's where we come full circle today. The advocacy continues on our social media platforms, on Facebook at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to www.plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. Another rich edition will be coming your way next week, same time. And until then, let's keep advocating for a better society. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually worked. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. What, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.